All right, we all ready? We're good, we'll have. All right, we are learning Mesechet Megillah, the Gemara, the analysis, and the stories that are found in the Talmud with regard to Megillah Esther. And the Gemara from Dafyud Aleph and onward, from page 11, side A and onward, begins with a careful analysis of the actual words of the Megillah. First, the Gemara gave us a couple of pages of preambles, various sermons that were given by rabbis thousands of years ago about the Megillah, the way they introduced the story, the way they framed the narrative, ideas which are important to helping us appreciate the deeper message of the Megillah. And then we began to examine the words of the Megillah itself. In the previous Gemaras that we studied, we have covered the whole first verse. By he be me Achashverosh, who Achashverosh, it was in the days of Achashverosh, that is the king. I can't call him the hero, I also can't call him the villain. The villain, the villain is Haman. The hero is Mordechai, the heroine is Esther. Achashverosh is somewhere in the middle. For part of the time he's allied with the, with the villain, eventually, and he gets allied with the, with the hero and heroine. But the Megillah begins with the description of Achashverosh because he's a very powerful man. And without him, there would be no story. That's, that's the way the villain was able to implicate the Jewish people. And that's also the way the villain was done in. So the Gemara now wants to establish Achashverosh's place in the sweep of history. How great was this Achashverosh? How powerful, how mighty was his kingdom? How important a person or a monarch was he? So the Gemara says on the bottom of Daf Yud Aleph Amad Aleph, Tanu Rabbanu, our rabbis learned, Shleisha Malchu Bekipa. There were three whose dominion was absolute. What is it meaning of Malchu? We know that Malchu is a, a permutation of the word Melech. That's the verb. Melech is a noun. Malchu is the verb. The noun is king, and in English you could say perhaps to rule over. But in Hebrew, most often the same word is used, in our Aramaic also like that. The same word is used in the noun form, in the verb form, sometimes even in the form of an adjective. But usually nouns and verbs are the same word, which actually makes sense. It's just the word when it's in a tense of a description of a matter of fact, what something is, or when it's being active. So a king is a melech, and one who rules is malach. So the Gemara tells us that there were three who ruled the kippa. What's a kippa? A yarmulke. Three who ruled with a yarmulke? What does that mean? So Rashi says that a kippa really means a dome. That's why the right word for, for this is not kippa. The right word is a yarmulke. And the yarmulke is a conjunction of two Aramaic words, which means Yorim Malka, or reverence, awe for the king. That's really what a yarmulke is supposed to be. It's a, a visual and an actual reminder that there's something above us. So in some faith systems, only the leaders of the faith system wear it. But for Jewish people, every one of us is supposed to have a personal relationship with God. So we have the kippa, the yarmulke, to remind us. Ask me why women don't have to wear a yarmulke, because they don't have to be reminded. They don't forget. Only men forget things. So men who forget all the time have to have a yarmulke, a yore malka. Why do, we, why do people call it a kippa? Because it's like a dome. That's how it's shaped. And because that's how it's shaped, in, I guess in modern Hebrew, people refer to it more often as a kippa than a yarmulke, describing its physical contours rather than its essential message. I once heard a story from Rabbi Moshe Feller. He's a senior shliach. Today, a very senior in his 80s already. So he was a, a younger man, and there was a delegation that met President Reagan, and he's a very short fellow. He's, he's a very tall stature, but physically very short. And President Reagan was a tall man, like 6'1 or 6'2. So he looked down at Rabbi Feller and his little bald head and his big yarmulke, and he said, Oh, that's a, a kippy, marvelous kippy you have there, isn't it? So Rabbi Feller was very feisty. He looked up at the president. He says, no, Mr. President, it's not a kippy. It's a yarmulke. So President Reagan said, what's a yarmulke? 
And he said, I must always know there is something above me. And that's what keeps me humble. I used to know there's something above me. It reminds me of the king. That's what he told President Reagan. That night was a state dinner, and President Reagan began his remarks with this idea of the yarmulke. He talked about the yarmulke. So when Prime Minister Harper came here, before he came, first he went into seclusion in a little, uh, <laughs> like a storage room afterwards. But when we met him and spoke a little bit, so one of the staffers came and they brought him a yarmulke that said uh, Harper Kent. Because Peter Kent was our MP and Harper was the Prime Minister. It was a nice conservative blue, royal blue yarmulke. So Harper Kent. But he came with the yarmulke. He was coming to a shul. It was the first time in his life he came to a shul. So he had a yarmulke. And the staffer put the yarmulke on his head. And he said to me, so now I have a keeper. So I told him the story of President Reagan. <laughs> and I said, the reason we have a yarmulke <laughs> is to remind us that there's something higher than our, our intelligence. He liked it. Anyway, so going back to the keeper story. So why, why do we call it a keeper? Because it's shaped like a dome. Okay. What's the world's largest dome? The biggest dome. Where, where, where would you find it? Huh? The heavens. the heavens. Exactly. The heavens are the biggest dome. <laughs> That's exactly what Rashi says. So he says, Mochu be keeper means tachas kol keeper zarakia under the dome of heaven. So under the dome of heaven essentially means everywhere. It's, it's an absolute monarchy. He, he controlled everywhere. That's a euphemistically. We say everything under, under the sky, everything under the heavens. The Aruch, who is like a kind of a, a dictionary written by one of the Rishonim, he also says that the idea of kippah means b'chol ha'olam kulay, kiloyma, in other words, tachas ha'shamayim, under the heavens, cha'asui ki which are formed like a dome, the stratosphere. Which is pretty interesting, by the way, that long before most of the Western world knew that the heaven is spherical, or that earth is round, in the Gemara it talks about the stratosphere in round terms, or in orbital terms, and we talk about, about the heavens that way. Who are these three kings? Who are the three epic emperors who ruled the entire world? So Gemara says, Ve'elohein, and these are they, Achav, Achashverosh, and Nebuchadnezzar. Those are the three kings. Now, one of the things that we are able to understand from this immediately is, is that we're referring to a very, very rare occurrence. Because human history, at least as is documented biblically, which begins 5,777 years ago, very early on tells us about monarchies. Already in the time of Avram Avinu, in the post-flood era, before Avram, we read about a great king, his name was Nimrod. He probably wasn't the first king, but he was a very famous king. And he rallied all the people together. And he got them to build a big tower. And he was planning to lead a rebellion against heaven. So, so kings started very early on. Within the first millennia of existence, for sure, there was already governance and there was already systems of monarchy and dominion and royalty and power and so on and so forth. And we read in the books of Genesis, book of Genesis and the stories in the Sidrot about numerous kings that are mentioned. Nimrod is mentioned. Avi Melech is mentioned, Malki Tzedek is mentioned, the Pharaoh is mentioned. And these are people who occupied thrones that had been there for decades or centuries, millennia before them. So there, there are many, many kings. And yet, we say, the Gemara makes this very, very powerful statement that there are three who ruled absolutely. And Ahasuerus is one of those three. Now in doing so, this positions Ahasuerus in a very unique place in that grand sweep of ancient history. It means he was one of the most powerful people who ever lived. Only, only Nebuchadnezzar and Ahasuerus were great, and, and Ahav were his equals. Now this is, this is problematic. It's problematic because in the, the period that Abel Lezer it says that Ahasuerus ruled over half the world. And there's a discussion of Ahasuerus losing some of his monarchy, that he ruled a hundred they ruled the whole world, and then he lost half his monarchy when, when Vashti was killed. People rebelled, countries rebelled against him. And then when Esther, when Esther uh, came, was, was married and became the queen, he became a little more popular, and an additional 11 countries were added to his repertoire and were under his dominion. But still not the, the whole number. In, in fact, there's a discussion in the writings of, of Chazal. It seems at one point that we identified 200 and 32 nations, 
or 232 independent systems of governance, and the other version is 252. And Ahasuerus only has 127. So if we say it's 232, half would be 116. 116, we would say, is what he lost. He lost, he had a big, mon- a big mighty empire, and he lost countries. Lost countries. Some, may, some maintain he, he controlled all, he lost half. And then when Esther became the queen, so 11 came back from 16, 11 takes you to 127. Okay. So, but, but, that, but this is, again, we have these conflicting traditions about how Ahasuerus ruled. Did he rule absolutely? Did he not rule absolutely? And, and how would we be able to understand this? So actually, there, there's, there's two, the, the, I mean, the, the two ways that we reconcile this. One way is we reconcile this by talking about that he used to be controlling the whole world and then, and then he was halved and then it went back up. That's one, one approach, one way of understanding it. And another way of understanding it is and this is the approach of the Chida in his Sefer Tzemach David. And I'm going to humbly submit that that is the only reasonable way we could really understand this. The Chida says that Ahasuerus could not have ruled the entire world, the whole globe. That makes no sense, he says. There, there, was, no, there was no unified the system of governance and there was, there was not even any kind of communication. What, what about the Americas, he said? <laughs> this mighty kingdoms, the Aztec. South America was mighty kingdoms before the Portuguese and the Spanish came and occupied their countries and denigrated their people. And then these same countries come and, and they lecture us in Israel. It's unbelievable. Or before Britain came or Germans came and occupied the United States, which was a, 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 an enormous continent filled with something like 17 different aboriginal countries or dominions. And they had, they had chiefs. We call them Indians, but it's a ridiculous name, actually. The aboriginal Americans, if you want to use that name, it wasn't even the Americas. That's, that's a foreign name. The Europeans came and stamped on it. The, the, the people living here, they had, they had, a, they had currency, they had, a, they, had, they, they, had, they had royalty, they had people who ruled, they had laws. I mean, they governed themselves. Yes, it's true, they, did not, they were not very sophisticated, and they hadn't changed much since the ancient times. They remained exactly as was. They were very connected to the nature and stuck with the land, and they didn't develop like we saw the same development that was in, in the Middle East Eurasia, the middle, even in China. We didn't see that kind of sophistication. Okay, that's for, for another day, why the sophistication didn't happen. There's actually a Torah theory behind that, that being something called Chatsi Kadra Tachton. We look at the world as Eretz Yisrael being on the top, and therefore Matan Torah had an impact on the whole world, but really on the top half of the globe, not on the bottom half of the globe. And because the Torah wasn't given, that's why the process of technology and the development of civilization was impeded and didn't go as quickly. But at any rate... To some, for somebody to say that Ahasuerus controlled the whole world is a patently ridiculous statement. We know that there were tribes of people who lived in Europe, what's today Europe. We know, we know, we have the archaeological records of this. We know that the Norse, when we're living in Greenland some 4,000 years ago, this is, this is documentable things. In, in all likelihood, the Norse were in the Americas long before Columbus came. They were seafaring people. So did Ahasuerus control them? I mean, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. What about China? The, Chi- the Chinese had like, unbelievable history. Right? The Great Wall of China, the Ming Dynasty. It was like a very, very prominent society, very developed, very sophisticated society. They invented gunpowder and paper and all kinds of other things that we use. So Ahasuerus controlled them. It doesn't make sense to say that. And the same is true with regard to Africa. The, the, the Chidah says it's impossible to suggest that Ahasuerus actually controlled the African continent. Africa had its own set, subset of governments, its own set of, 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 of anthropology and, and, and leaders and rules. Yes, it's true. Mitzrayim, Egypt, was very developed. Egypt was a highly developed country. And Kush, Ethiopia, was a highly developed country. But these were really part of the Middle East. It seems more part of the Middle East. When you go into Central Africa, is there was absolutely no communication between Central Africa and, and people who lived in, 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 the, in the Mediterranean basin. So the Chida, therefore, says that what we're really talking about here is Southern Europe and Asia. He says what people call Eurasia the Middle East and the Iberian Peninsula. That's where he says, that's where Ahasuerus is. The, that was the ancient Persian Empire. It actually makes sense. We, 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 know, we know the ancient Persian Empire was. And that's where it was. It dominated all the way down to India. That's true. Where the Persian Empire, that, there was a whole Silk Route. 
So the, to parts of the Orient, or the, at least the Orient is the wrong word, probably, but in India and Pakistan, Afghanistan, these parts, this was part of, all the way up into Kazakhstan, the Caucasus. There was that, the Persian Empire was that big. The Persian Empire dominated Eurasia, or at least most of Asia, the Middle East and Asia, and parts of North Africa. So why do we say he controlled the whole world? What we would have to say is that most of the world's population at that time was in these areas. The other, others was much smaller pockets of humanity. And perhaps what's most important for our purposes is this is where all the Jews lived. This is where the Jews lived. So when Ahasuerus controlled 127 provinces and he made sure to send letters to 127 provinces, he made sure to send letters of annihilation wherever Jews lived. Wherever Jews lived, they found out that they were going to get killed. Well, obviously there had to be Jews living in India at the time of the Megillah. Now, there, there were Jews living in China, but there's no evidence that the Jews lived in China previous to the second base of Migdash. Because all of the things that we have found, all of the Chinese artifacts that we found, including the prayer books, one of them is located in the museum, in the Royal Ontario Museum, just down, down the road here. And the famous Haggadah, which is reprinted. And the, and, and the Torah scrolls, which have uh, kind of Sephardic cases to them. All of these things are in keeping with the traditions of the second base of Migdash. Interestingly, the Haggadah follows the Hill opinion of Beis Shammai. It's not, it's, yeah, it's not Yak Nahaz. When, when, you have, when you have Saturday night falling on Pesach, the order of when you make the bracha, the besam, when you make the, not the besam, pardon me, on the, on the candle, when you make the bracha of Zman, the Shech Yonu, Beis Shammai and Basil have a, dis, a dispute, and they follow the opinion of Beis Shammai, which dates them, which dates them. So we know they are from the middle Second Temple period. But there's no proof that Jews lived there in the ancient times. Now, the Gemara is going to ask, what about Alexander? Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, is, he built the greatest empire ever. He didn't live very long to enjoy it. And the Gemara's answer is, we're not talking about Alexander because that's post-biblical. This is biblical times. Okay? This is the biblical, what, what, the world, what we would refer to today probably as the ancient world. Although most people would probably correctly say, according to the Western way of, of, of dating things and of, of using nomenclature, that Alexander the Great is the ancient world and Rome is the ancient world and Greece is the ancient world. But we're talking about a different ancient. We're talking about the biblical era and specifically what the world would call the Old Testament because their testament is long, long, long after Alexander and many other things, all, all the way into the Roman Empire. But the biblical era for us concludes in the first century of the second base of Migdash, and that is before the time of Alexander. So Alexander is not discussed. So when we say, what are we talking about? Biblically. Ahasuerus is a biblical figure. The book of Esther is a biblical book, part of our Apocrypha. So, so that's the statement that we make. And now we understand that from a biblical vantage point, Ahasuerus is one of the three most powerful men ever to have walked the face of the ancient world, at least in the Asian continent, Middle East and Asia. So the Gemara says, how do we know this? And the Gemara says, well, how do we know it? Because the Torah says so. Because there are scripture that backs us up. Achav. Now, Achav was a man who was not happy with Eliyahu Hanavi. And because he was happy with Eliyahu Hanavi, in the Book of Kings, there's a story about Achav who decides to pursue Eliyahu Hanavi. And he wants to rub him out. So, what does he do? In the Book of Kings, we are told, he says, Chai Hashem Alekecha. I swear by the life of God. Im yesh goyim amlocha, asholeh adoy nisham levakeshcha. He says, I looked everywhere for you, Achav says about Elio. I said, I swear by God, there is a single country that I didn't try to hunt you down in. Where were you? How did you evade capture? Now, he goes on to say there that he made each government take an oath that they didn't know where Eliyahu Navi was. And the Gemara says that if Ahav was able to send messengers and make demands and people had to give him their word and their oath that there was no government that was protecting him, what does that tell us? So Eliyahu Navi is a fugitive. But fugitives are always being protected by somebody. Like, like people say that bin Laden was, uh, was a fugitive. Nobody knew where he was. 
My personal theory is that that's not true. I think Pakistan knew exactly where he was. But I think Pakistan decided they didn't care. Why, why should they give him up? They're not really an American ally. They play the game. And then when the United States discovered, because somebody delivered pizza and threw out something from a phone or whatever, somehow they discovered that they figured out that this has got to be bin Laden. They went to the Pakistani government and they said, hey, you got bin Laden. And they said, um, we know what you're talking about. They said, no, no, we, we, know, yeah, we know where he is. And they probably said something like, do whatever you want and we'll, we'll sound angry, which is what happened. So the United States came in there and they came with the two helicopters. One they blew up on the spot so it shouldn't get found or something was wrong with it. And they carried out that famous assassination of one of the most evil men in the modern times, in Osama bin Laden. And then Pakistan condemned the United States and yelled and screamed. Of course it had to. It had to please the street. And it played the game. And the United States made believe that Pakistan didn't know that bin Laden was hiding there. And everybody made, played this game. And, you know, in 50 years from now, the rest of the story will come out, but nobody will really care anymore. It will just be a matter of history books. It's not going to affect anybody's life. As they say, those who know don't speak, and those who speak don't know. So... But, but this is a modern example of Elio as a fugitive. Where is this fugitive going to hide? Now, Saddam Hussein was not, actually not being really hidden by anybody, but still, the CIA was on, his, tra on his, tra his trail, and they kept coming to a farm a day after he escaped. He was living like a rat. He was living in a hole in the ground, and, and they eventually found him. So Achav is looking all over Elio, and he's making governments take oaths. The government to make a formal statement. No, we don't know where that guy is. Now, if you have no power over them, how could you come imagine the United States would come to Pakistan and say to Pakistan, we demand information about bin Laden. And Pakistan will say, we don't know what you're talking about. Are you ready to do that under oath? Can we take it to the international court? And Pakistan will say, jump in the lake. You take us. Why should you take us to the international court? Who, who are you that we should have to answer to you? Why bother? But the fact that they did have to answer to Akhav, this shows you that there was a certain dominion, a certain power that he had. And he said there wasn't a single kingdom. There wasn't a stone they left unturned. Well, in that case, it's pretty clear that, that, that Achav was a Meishel Bekipa, that all of the countries in Asia were under the sway of Achav. That seems very clear over there. If he wasn't king over them, how would he be able to make them take an oath? How would he put them under the weight of perjury and say, you have to promise me, you have to take an oath? How would he do that? So it couldn't be. But, it, but, it, but he did do that. So if so, the Gemara says we can see very clearly that he was an absolute monarch who ruled over the entirety of what we'll call the civilized world. And I use that very, very loosely. It's almost like a racist statement. It's like saying the Chinese weren't civilized, the Aztec weren't civilized, uh, the Norse weren't civilized. Maybe they weren't, I don't know. But, but some of these countries were very civilized. And we have relics and artifacts to prove how civilized they were. Some of them were a lot more civilized than the Babylonians and the Persians. Okay. So that's the biblical world. Incidentally, I should note that in, in the biblical uh, frame, we, don't, we never hear about China. China doesn't appear in the biblical frame, nor does, nor does Europe, nor does even Spain. I mean, the, the, he goes so far as to say, as the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain, and Gibraltar, so he's, either Chidah says that wasn't included either. And, that, and actually, that's correct, historically. Well, we know that that was not part of the Persian Empire. Whether Jews lived in Spain at the time is a really good question. You'll tell me the Jews are Sephardic. But really, Sephardic is a euphemism. Those are Jews who came from Babylon. Eventually, they migrated west, and they ended up in Sephardic. It's very possible there were no Jews living there. In fact, the Dane of the Megillah is that all the Jews were under the sway of Ahasuerus, and all the Jews' lives were threatened, so probably there were no Jews living there were no Sephardic Jews, no Jews living in Sephardic, no Jews living in Spain. So that's the first person whose power has been established as absolute. Who's next? Well, historically, after Ahav, the next biblical king who holds such a massive power in his hands is Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the whole world. How do we know this? Because it is written in the book of Yirmiyahu with regard to Nebuchadnezzar. And it would come to pass that the nation and the kingdom who would not place his neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that then would, he would be greeted by sword and famine, by pestilence 
and he would be destroyed. Destroyed. This was the threat of Nebuchadnezzar. Submit or be destroyed. And everybody submitted. And he conquered everybody and everything. Well, that Pasuk is very clear. It says, Hagoi v'hamam locha. So Hagoi v'hamam locha means the kingdom, the, the nation, means all nations, all kingdoms living in Asia were under the sway of Nebuchadnezzar. What about Achashverosh? How do we know that Achashverosh ruled the whole world? It just said he had a very big empire. It says, Hamolech mehoidu v'ad kush, from India to Ethiopia, which we discussed in the previous Gemara, there's two opinions whether these two countries are very close to each other, whether, 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 whether India here means the India that we call India, or in fact, it may be referring to Qatar, maybe referring to, to Kuwait, I mean, not to, not to Kuwait, to um, Yemen or Qatar, and, and maybe you're talking about uh, Arabia and Yemen and Qatar, maybe a very small place just across Africa, right near, right near the Reed Sea. But the truth is, we learned earlier that that statement, if they were very close to one another, that statement is to say that Ahasuerus' power was so absolute that just as he controlled these areas, which were very close to one another, that's the kind of control he had over the entirety of his empire, all 127 provinces. So Ahasuerus, how do we know? And the Gemara responds, what are you talking about? The Megillah tells us that. From that which is written, Rashi says, Mehoidu v'ad kush. So Vahid v'ad tells us that it was 127 now, this Fasemis takes exception to, to, to Rashi because of the previous Gemara, but as I said, the simple way of explaining this is that the Gemara is speaking euphemistically when it says Bahidivat Kush, and it's speaking to us about the power wielded by Achashverosh. That despite the fact that he ruled over many different civilizations, or at least cultures, and different nations who had different jingoism and patriotism that dominated each and every part of the world. Each one had their own foods, each one had their own national dress, each one had their own cultural holidays, and yet, Ahasuerus was able to control all of them, which is an extraordinary feat, as we talked about in our previous class. Okay, so now we have established Ahasuerus's position in the great sweep of history. And we have, this is a page turner today. It's so exciting, we're going to turn the page. The page of Dafir Aleph Ahmed Beis, page 11, side B, begins with letters and parentheses, which on the surface seem to mean nothing. Now, a little bit of history. When the Talmud was being formulated, most, mostly it was committed to memory. Very few people had the ability to write the entire Talmud or to have scrolls that covered the entire Talmud. Certainly not individuals. Maybe academies had, major libraries had. So how did people study Talmud? They committed to memory. In the time of the of Rabbanu Savaroi, which is the last, where the last tweaks were still being made in the Talmud, even though the period of the Talmud had already been closed, but the Talmud was still being perfected, and there was still, you know, like different versions which were being fine-tuned, it appears that they created something called Simanim. They created signs, making it easier to memorize the Gemara. For whatever reason, most of these Simanim were lost. We only have a relative handful of the simanim, of the signs. But you can understand, the signs don't have much use to us today because unless you happen to be studying Talmud by heart and you would use these signs. But this sign is, it says, Simon Shazdach. Sign, sign is Shazdach. What does Shazdach stand for? Oh, Rashi tells us, very simple. We are now going to discuss four mighty kings of the biblical world who we would have thought should be included in the discussion of epic emperors who control the whole world. Who are those four kings? Shlomo is going to be talked about. Sancherev is going to be talked about. Daryovish, Darius, and Koresh. All of these people will be talked about. Now you do the acronym here. Shazdach, Shazdach says Rashi, stands for the four kings. Shlomo, Sancherev, Daryovish, Koresh. Now if you were committing the Gemara by heart, it would be very easy for you to know the next section of the Gemara. All you'd have to remember was Shazdach. And once you remember Shazdach, you knew what you were talking about. So instead of having to memorize 12 lines or 15 lines of Gemara, all you had to memorize was three letters. And it was very easy to know. Then you would know there was a question and answer about Shlomo Melech, a question and answer about Sancherev, a question and answer about Daryovish and Korish. Anyway, I don't know what happened to the signs. I don't know if anybody really knows. Somehow they got lost. I guess they weren't in use. And, and somehow... Whatever, whatever few ones still remained by the time they printed the Talmud were printed, included in the Talmud and most of them, as I said, somehow didn't make it. 
Okay, now you know what the Gemara is. Incidentally, there are some of Farshim who read into this. They, they say that this is actually more than just an acronym for names, but Shas and Dach stand for two words that actually describe the parlance of the, two, the give and take of the questions. But I don't want to go into that. It's a little more complicated. Explain how the words Shas and Dach explains each one of the, of the questions and answers, and it kind of simplifies the whole equation of the question and answer of these four different narratives, of four different people. Anyway, going back to the Gemara, the Gemara's response to that statement that Ahasuerus is one of three people in the entirety of biblical history. That's, that's huge. It's a big statement. One of three people? Imagine if you make a statement about, you know, everybody talks about the president of the United States of America as soon as swearing in the 45th president. Imagine if you could make a statement like, oh, this guy Trump is only two other presidents who ever accomplished or did what he did. People would say, oh, wow. Or about outgoing president Obama is leaving office. Said, you know, he leaves office. Only two other presidents in the history of the United States were able to accomplish something like this. 45 presidents, not that many people. You would say, wow. Of the whole 45, only two others? He's one of three? That would like be amazing. So, I didn't, say, I didn't say that's the case, by the way, but either of them, but that's not the point. The point is, you would be amazed and the United States is not even 300 years old. It's, it's a... It's a very young country. Now we're talking about a biblical era that spans millennia, several millennia. And despite the fact that it spans several millennia, there are only three people who ever accomplished or reached such a level of mass dominion. This puts Ahasuerus in a very, very important place in that grand sweep of history. I mean, this, this guy was big, very important. And interestingly, the Mepharshim and the Megillah they talk about this and they say, do you know why he became so grand and important? Because Hashem wanted that the Jewish people, when they would have their challenge during the time of Purim, the challenge should come from the mightiest country in the world. It's like in our honor. We don't just get persecuted by, by nobodies. We get persecuted by the biggest, the greatest of the great. That's who comes against us. And also gives you an understanding that Ahasuerus actually could have done this. Had, his, had he stood, ended up standing behind this decree, it was not an empty threat. This actually could have happened. World jury could have been no more. But the Gemara is going to challenge this. The Gemara says, well, using biblical texts, we can identify at least four other people who also had this mastery in the minion. How could you make a statement like that? And that is the typical way the Gemara acts. The, Gemara, the Gemara's methodology is statement. The Gemara says, well, prove that statement. I'm going to cross-examine your statement. Who are the people? So the Gemara first starts off, Vesuleka. And besides these three, there are no others. You're really ready to stand behind that statement? Challenge number one. Vaha'ika Shlomo. There is, after all, Shlomo HaMelech. So the Gemara says, true, Shlomo HaMelech was a very mighty king. And that was the only time ever in the ancient world that the Jewish people were actually the empire, the world's greatest empire at the time. However, the problem with Shlomo is Lesolik Malchuse. His kingdom didn't last. Shlomo didn't fill, finish his position. And there's uh, much to be said about this. There's a Gemara in Gitten that talks about a, a demon king whose name is Ashmedai. He was the king of the demons. And the Gemara tells a story of Shlomo HaMelech who sent for the demons. Why did he want to control the sent for the demons? Because he wanted to build a base on Migdash. And ideally, a base on Migdash is a, is a building that's built without the assistance or aid of any metal. But the base on Migdash is built of stone. How do you build a massive compound, enormous compound, one of the greatest buildings of the ancient world? How do you build that without having any metal touch the stone? You have to chisel the stone. So, incidentally, in the second base on Migdash, where there were no miracles, everything was done literally, of course they chiseled the stone, but the stone was chiseled off-site. By the time you came to the building of the Beis HaMikdash, and we have records of the building of the second Beis HaMikdash, there was a period of over 70,000 laborers working in tandem. Now imagine a construction site with 70,000 laborers with no noise. Imagine the majesty of that. To see 70,000 people, you know, you see a construction site today, there's banging, there's a din, there's, there's the, the noise of construction. Quiet. Because 
there was not a single artifact, an implement of metal that was used once those stones were brought. All of them, they're all scored. We know the stones, we see them, all off-site. And then they somehow, we don't even know how they did this. They rolled these mass, some of these massive stones up the mountain all the way to the Temple Mount to be able to build the base of Megdash. It seemed like an invincible building. Now, Shlomo HaMelech heard that there was a worm whose name was the Shamir. And the Shamir was a worm who could eat stone, a split stone. And I don't, I don't believe we know anything about such a worm today who can actually eat stone. I mean, termites eat wood, but I don't know who eats stone. And we don't even know if such, a, such a, uh, an animal exists today, but it was the case at the time, and that's the story. He could split the stone. But nobody knew how to get the Shamir. So the demons knew. And the Gemara is rife with discussions about demons, and it seems to be very much a part of life, even though in our modern day and age, there are no longer any demons. Instead, we have technology. And they can be even more bewitching than the ancient demons of once upon a time. Now, just like you would come to somebody in a few hundred years ago, and you would show him a piece of plastic and metal in your hand, and glass, and say, you see this little thing? This is called an iPhone. And in here, I have more books than you have in the Library of Congress. I can have these books over here. And not only I have more books than that, I can speak to somebody at the other end of the world. In fact, I'm doing it right now. The people all over the world can be watching, listening, and seeing in real time what's going on with this class right now. And it's all in this little piece that fits right in my palm. And you try to tell it to somebody 200 years ago. And he would send you straight to the equivalent of a, mentally, of a place for mentally unstable people. But it's true. I know. It's, we, we just... They couldn't fathom what we know today. We have mastered the natural sciences. We have mastered technology. Okay, so once upon a time, they mastered the, spirit, the world of spirits. And we don't know what that means anymore today. Big deal. I mean, it's like really so hard to imagine. Yes, there's a world. There are demonic spirits. There, there, are, there are telltale signs of, of, of these things even today. But we don't have the ability to see or communicate or actually deal with this reality. In the same way that we don't get to see electricity either. Electricity is, is a phenomenon that cannot be visualized by the human eye. And it cannot be touched by the human hand. It can be felt, but it can't be touched. It can be, you can see the impact, but you actually cannot actually see electrical energy. Or an electrical energy field. At any rate, the bottom line was that once upon a time, demons were very much a part of human life. And Shlomo HaMelech did something very daring. He started up with the king of the demons. He actually captured him. He had him brought in chains. And he got advice and then Ashmedei led a secret war against him. And in the end, Shlomo HaMelech does not have full dominion anymore because of this. Now, there's a big discussion in the Gemara whether this happens earlier in Shlomo HaMelech's uh, monarchy in the beginning or it only happens towards the end. So the Gemara makes a statement. The Gemara says that he was a big king. He did control everything. And then, and then he didn't in the end. That's why he's not listed. So the Gemara says, This would work for the opinion that says, Melech Vehedyet. First he was a king, and then he was downgraded. Became more of a commoner. When Ashmedei kind of usurped him, and took away his throne. There's a whole fascinating story, and you might get about that. Laman da Omar Molech Vehedyet. U Molech. That it's true Shlomo Melech had a fall, and it's true that he had a downgraded period, but that later he bounced back, and he reached the same perfection maybe even greater, a higher zenith than earlier. So Michael Lameimar, what would you say then? What would you, why would Shlomo Amel be included? What he, because he had a setback in his career? A lot of people have setbacks. When you have somebody who begins on top of the world and he ends on the bottom of the heap, you can't say that a, a person that he's li lives on in history is one of the great emperors of the world. Nobody says that Napoleon was one of the great emperors of the world. He did not die as a great emperor, he died as the great loser. An islands, in an island. Somebody remind me of the name. I thought it was the Galapagos, but I was a mis I'm mistaken. Um, now it'll come to me. Anyway, they exiled Napoleon off to this island where there was very few people and a bunch of animals. And Napoleon basically went crazy because he was a megalomaniac and expected to order people around. He would yell at the birds. He would yell at the people there. And they would just ignore him. This little shrimp who was yelling at them. Basically, the British, they took away from him every ounce of kishkas, every ounce of his strength. They, they turned him into a nobody. So you could say Napoleon made a big splash, but he would not go down in history as one of the great epic emperors of the world because he didn't die a great epic emperor. You want to say Julius Caesar was a great emperor. He died a great emperor. Napoleon did not die a great emperor. He died a great loser. The British defeated him at Waterloo, and he was finished afterwards. And the French empire that he built sank very, very quickly. So if Yishai Shalem was great, 
And then, and then he had a setback, a massive setback. He was a head yet, he's relatively speaking, from being the greatest of kings. He became downgraded, so he became like a commoner. Okay, fine. But if we are to say that the notion, the notion of Shlomo HaMelech's setback was temporary, and that afterwards Shlomo HaMelech rose to greatness once again, well, if he rose to greatness once again, then the obvious question is, so why would we say that Shlomo shouldn't be included? He had a setback in, in middle? Okay, he had a setback. A setback doesn't, doesn't, doesn't take his position in history. So the Gemara comes back with a question. I don't understand. Explain to me what your criterion is, because Shlomo, King Solomon, should have, by all accounts, been included in this list of epic emperors. So the Gemara says, well, you have to understand. Shlomo milso achrise havebe. Shlomo is a, in a different category. It's a different category. He's a different category because in biblical narrative, he's Mesha Malach Al El Yoinim. He he ruled over heavenly creatures too. Let's take a look in Rashi. Rashi says Solik Machuse, Lehishla Machuse. He didn't finish his dominion. Shahri Nitrad, he was he was overwhelmed. And he was he was he was he was he had so much pressure and so many difficulties that he was unable to continue to function. So the Gemara Sahani Khlaman Damarim in the Msechtas Git in the Perik Mishakhze, fine. But but what about the other opinion? So the Gemara says Shlomo is different. Why? Because he ruled Al Ha El Yoinim. Al Ha El Yoinim, Rashi says, means Allah Shadim. Not on the angels, but the Shadim, the demons, who are called relatively a higher form of life, at least higher than our terrestrial form of life. All right. So so Shlomo HaMelech, because he ruled in this fashion. That's why, as it is written, Shenemar, it says about Shlomo HaMelech in the book of Chronicles, it says, Vayeshev Shlomo Akise Hashem, Shlomo sat on the throne of God. Throne of God, so this is a, this is like a, a very powerful statement. And we use anthropomorphical language when we speak about God. We say God is Reich Varovis, God rides or sits in the heavens. And Shlomo HaMelech, was, had a power uh, over the world of spirit, not just over the terrestrial or technical world. And therefore, Shlomo HaMelech is a different kind of king. Now, the Rashba has a different interpretation, a different understanding of this concept entirely. The Rashba says, it's not about demons, and it's not about spirits. It's about the kind of kingship that Shlomo HaMelech had. Typically speaking, if somebody is an epic emperor, what must always go along with being an epic emperor? What must come along with that kind of power? What must always come along? With political power of that magnitude, what else must come along? This is not a trick question. How is it possible to have political power that dominates in such a fashion? You have to be strong. What does that mean in plain English? You have to be a military. Right. A military. When the United States emerged after the Cold War as being the sole superpower, what made the United States the sole superpower? Well, when Ukraine seceded from the Soviet Union and Latvia and Estonia, all the Baltic states succeeded, succeeded and, 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 the, and the, the, the Caucasus uh, out in, in the east of Russia succeeded. So what happened then? Russia was majorly downgraded. The Russian army was downgraded. And because the Russian military prowess was downgraded, what happened to Russia? It was no longer the superpower. They haven't gotten over that, by the way. They're, they're smarting. They're not happy about that. The United States had incredible military power. And we saw it during the Bush era when they decided to eliminate a very, very powerful man named Saddam Hussein. The United States started to eliminate him, and they did eliminate him. They created him too. Yeah, they created a bigger disaster afterwards. I'm not, uh, one can wonder if it was better or worse afterwards. This is a good question that I'm not going to discuss now, and it's irrelevant actually to this class. My point is that if you're the most powerful country, then, then people will listen to you. The world understands power. That's the reality. We live in a, in a, in a world with, that is dominated by power. If you're strong, you'll be listened to. Now, the United States has other powers. The United States is also very powerful economically. So if the United States would decide to break a country economically, they could break the country economically. 
right? In theory, they could. Why, did, why was Cuba able to survive all these years? Because the other superpower was backing them. Cuba would not have been able to stand up to the United States. The United States decided to go to war with Cuba. But Russia said, you go to war with Cuba, you go to war with us. And that Russia was the counterweight, right? So a superpower always requires a military. In his wisdom, George Washington enthroned the president of the United States, which was a position that he created. They wanted to make him an emperor. George Washington's people, they believed in him. He was probably the most popular president ever. And they wanted to crown him as King George. And he said, absolutely not. I will not be a king. And we revolted against that. Now you want to rebuild that? No way. And therefore, George Washington, along with the founding fathers of the United States, created a system of governance that would have a president or an executive branch of government. But the executive branch of government would be balanced by a judicial branch of government and the House of Congress. The house, the, 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 which, would be, which would have Congress or, the, or, or representatives of each state, which would, be, would follow the demography, how many people are living in each state, and then every state would have a House of Senate. So the Senate and the Congress, which together makes up the House of Senate, those are, those are your three branches of government. There's the federal government, there's the executive branch of government, and there's the judicial branch of government. And you know why they're created at arm's length from one another? They're created at arm's length so as to limit the amount of power a president will have. Why? Because the United States is a republic, and a republic means that it has to live by certain ideals. And those ideals are safeguarded because you have law. The president is supposed to follow the law, at least he's supposed to, and Congress inhibits him. But George Washington also understood that if a president will not control the army, then what you will have is a disaster. He will never have real power. And therefore, in the United States, the president who's really a very powerful man, is called Commander. the Commander-in-Chief. Even if he has no military experience, forget no political experience, if no military experience, he's still called Commander-in-Chief. Ultimately, he's the one who decides, do we go to war or not? He makes those decisions. Now, hopefully, he's smart enough to get some people with a lot of military experience who will be able to guide him. That's your case of cabinet. The point is like this. The point is, Monarchy, governance, dominion, power, it all goes hand in hand with the military might. Russia was an economic time bomb, eventually collapsed, but they lasted for a very long time with very little money, or at least very little economic growth. How? Because they had a massive military. That's what they put their strength into. Russia had a massive military. Well, so they, took, they took all the guilt to the military and the people starved. The United States, everybody did well. Well, most people did well. And there's still a, a massive military. Massive yes, of course. Because <laughs> you, you can't spend on everything. Like, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Bottom line, there is one monarchy in history that functions otherwise. There was only one emperor ever in history who did not have his power from economic Economic force or military force? Who was that man? Who was that king? Shlomo HaMelech. Rashba says we cannot incorporate Shlomo HaMelech in this conversation because he was a different kind of king. Because the, United, the Israel did not have a military. In fact, David HaMelech was a great general and a great warrior and he led his nation in battle. And after David HaMelech, the military folded. It's the only country in world history that was a dominant force, an empire, that did so not by the spirit of force, but rather by the force of spirit. Wow. And that was Shlomo HaMelech. Why was Shlomo HaMelech revered? Why was he respected? Because he had a, an army behind him? Because he could threaten sanctions and ruin your economy? No. People sent tribute. They wanted, they begged him. They wanted to be part of, they wanted to be under, under his sway. They sent him taxes. Who does that? Because Shlomo was universally recognized as the wisest person. They said the man has wisdom, the man has spirit, the man has a holy and a spiritual stature. And that's how he was able to have an empire. So actually, those who think that the Jewish people are, 
a military people like all others are sorely mistaken. Yes, we have had military victories and certainly we need to have an army. But nonetheless, the one time in history when we actually were in a state of might, of global might, we were an empire, the one time is when we didn't have an army. And Shlomo Amal did not fight a single battle during the entire tenure, over 40 years. He did not fight a single battle. Not a single arrow was shot. Not a single skirmish. As far as we know, the military was massively downgraded. And that is very unusual. So it doesn't fit the trajectory of this conversation. When we talk about epic emperors, every single one of these epic emperors, every one of them, either was engaged in warfare or had a massive army to prevent warfare. They were all ruled by the power of the military. They were all ruled by might. It was all the spirit of force. So Ahasuerus, did he actually go to war? He, he threatened to go to war. That was good enough. The Rebbe used to say that you want peace in the Middle East? Make sure the IDF is the strongest army in the Middle East. That's you'll have peace. Why? Because you're dealing with people who don't want peace. You're dealing with people who want war. With people who endlessly have feuds. Endless skirmishes. Endless battles. Endless, endless acrimony. So how are you going to stop it? Why wouldn't they attack you? Because you can explain to them the beautiful liberal ideas of peace. You know who you're talking to? That was Bush's mistake. He said he's going to bring democracy to Iraq. You can't bring democracy to Iraq. People didn't, they didn't want to have democracy. They didn't want to do with it. It turned into ISIS. That's what it turned into. He ruled it on Iron Fist. Sure he did. There's no other way to rule in that part of the world. So, so the notion that he would be able to introduce this idea to a people that's not interested in it is, is, is foolhardy. It doesn't make any sense. And, but this is, this, is the, this is the big point. This is the point. That, so, so how do you rule in that part of the world? How do you have peace? Everybody's afraid to fight. Why would the United States and Russia never had a war? Because they were both very strong. That's why. Because they were both very strong. It was the fear of mutually assured destruction. That's what kept the world in peace. So we call it the Cold War. Nobody will tell you, oh, there was such peaceful years. There were such beautiful years of peace in Kumbaya, you know, from, from 1949 up until 1989, everything was beautiful, and then the Soviet Union collapsed and all the peace started. That's when the war started. Well, no. Actually, there was a state of war. The United States was in a technical state of war with the Soviet Union. It was a cold war. Again, military power. So military power either is used, it's either by the, by the, by the action, or if not by the action, by the spirit of force. But Shlomo Amalek ruled differently. Is the only such emperor ever in history not to have the spirit of force. So in that case, the Gemara says, you really can't include him over here. Okay, so Shlomo is ruled out. Now we know we're not talking about when the epic emperor conversation, Shlomo HaMelech is a non-starter. So the Gemara says, okay, let's talk about Sancherev. Sancherev was the man who built the original empire. We don't know that much about Ahav and his power, but Sancherev? Sancherev conquered the whole world, including most of Israel, by the way. He, he, he conquered the ten tribes, the northern kingdom, Malchus Yisrael, and he dispersed them. And Sancherev was such a wily fellow, in order to make sure that his empire would be able to survive, what he did is, he ensured that there would be no indigenous peoples who would lead a rebellion. So he took all the people and displaced them. The people living in Egypt, he sent them somewhere else. The people living somewhere else, he sent to a different country. He mixed up all the populations because, you know, the Soviet Union it was, it was the, under, the, under the, the jackboot, under the KGB, the threat. And the moment of perestroika, the moment the Soviet Union put all of a sudden, all of a sudden this, this, this dormant jingoism came out of nowhere. All of a sudden, everybody was patriotic. Ukraine, Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia. I was, when I was in Russia, I had to get through one of the borders going from Russia to, to, to Ukraine. And whatever, it's a long story, I didn't exactly have a visa. But in Russia, this is a way of life. You give him rubles and you go through. So like, I was with my friend who spoke Russian better than me. He points to the guy's hat, it's called the Shapka. And the guy had the same military insignia in his, in, oh, sorry, he's wearing the same uniform. The same uniform, the Russian soldiers on the other side of the border. The same exact uniform, the same rifles. Everything was the same. <laughs> so we had a, a Russian visa. So he opens the passport. He says, eh, visa. So, et a visa. Here's a visa. Not a visa. It's not a visa. No, no. Et a visa. Et a visa. He says, et a visa na Paruski. Na Rusla. Et a Ukraina. So this is for Russia. This is not, not even Ukraine. So my friend goes, Russia, Ukraina. 
the guy went like, he went crazy. He started to scream at the top of his lungs. It's Ukraine! I thought he was going to pop blood vessels. I was terrified. The guy with a, with a Kalashnikov screaming at you. And he's pointing at this tiny little pin, some probably made in China, that, you know, for about 11 cents, with a different insignia. Same exact uniform. What, the Ukraine had money to, to go and buy their own uniforms? <laughs> so they're in 1994. Like, same uniform. Everything's the same. But they changed the pin. He put a different pin in it. It's Ukraine! It was like... I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm probably too scared to think that, but after thinking afterwards, this is a guy who never heard of Ukraine as independent as Russia. They're all hammered together for the Soviet Union. Not him and not his parents. Maybe his grandparents lived in independent, maybe. And anyway, Ukraine was under the czars, I think. And yet, they still maintained, three generations later, there still the, was this vicious patriotism. Don't you dare call me a Russian. I'm a Ukrainian. So Sancher was a smart guy. He knew this. And he figured the way he's going to do this is take the Ukrainians and send them to Latvia. Take the Latvia and send them to Kazakhstan. He exiled everybody. So everybody is, is in exile. And if everybody's in exile, then there was not going to be this natural sense of belonging to a land and have a rebellion and have sedition against, against the, 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 the occupying army. Incidentally, it didn't work in the end anyway. Why? Because Sancher's generals himself fought. And then... Uh, <laughs> But in theory, he tried to do that. And he wasn't the first one to try this. The first one in history ever to try this was a man named Joseph. Yeah, biblical Joseph. What did Joseph do? At the end of the famine, when nobody had anything left, and they begged him for seeds to start to plant the land again because the land is coming to life, but nobody had any seeds to plant. Joseph said, pay. Hey, we don't have anything. Write your land over. Write your land over. Write your bodies over. So they signed over everything. He created this unbelievable dictatorship. The people didn't own their own bodies. And then Yosef said, it's not your land, it's not your body. I will send you wherever you want, wherever I want. And he displaced the entirety of the land of Egypt. Why? Because he figured this way everybody will be a stranger. So when my brothers come, when the Jewish people will come, they won't have to feel like strangers. He knew there was going to be Golos Mitzrayim. He tried to mitigate the impact of Golos Mitzrayim. It didn't help, by the way. But, but that, so, so this is a very, it was a very old idea. Sancherev thought of this idea. And Sancherev controlled the whole world. So the Gemara said, if Sancherev controlled the whole world, surely he is an epic emperor? Why isn't he included? The Ahave Sancherev, there was after all Sancherev. And Sancherev was a man who controlled the whole world. We know this. How do we know this? Because it says, the Chsiv is a verse in Yeshayo. It says, Ki ha In all of these lands, in all of these lands, Asher Hitziloi es Arza Miyodi is somebody who can save himself from my hand? In other words, is there somebody I don't have control over in all of these lands? So the only way that you could say that is if you own all of these lands, you control all of these lands. And since he makes that statement that he controls all of these lands, so then in that case, he controlled all those lands. If he controlled all those lands, he is the ultimate epic emperor. Why is he not included? So the Gemara says, you forget a very important detail, my friends. Ha'ika Yerushalayim. There was Jerusalem. The Loi Kivasha. Jerusalem was never captured. Mind you, Sancherev marched on Jerusalem. Sancherev encircled Jerusalem. Sancherev told the people of Jerusalem that your days are numbered. Submit, surrender. And the people very seriously considered doing exactly that. And the truth is that Sancherev was fearsome. And he said, if, if you don't surrender, if I come in, I will slaughter all of you. And the people were ready to give in to the king of Assyria. Sancherev conquered the entirety of Judea. He conquered Hebron. He conquered Shechem. All these cities, the fortresses that the, the Chizkiyo HaMelech built. His army was decimated. His fort, forts were captured. His people already were, 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 were under, under, under captivity. And then he was going to march he marched, actually, on the capital. He was going to capture the capital of Israel. Yerushalayim is our eternal capital, even if the UN doesn't think so. That's the historical fact, and Hashem gave it to us, and that's the way it's always been. And the world understood that very well, and they still understand it today. They say Yerushalayim is not Jewish, but they know it is. And because of their hatred for us, that's why they want to deny our connection to it. 
And there's nothing new to that. Sancherov understood the power of Jerusalem, and he knew that until he conquers Jerusalem, Israel will not be vanquished. The Romans could only put on their Arc de Triumph, they could only put Judea Capta. Judea is vanquished only after Yerushalayim would fall. Yeah, or Mitzada, whatever. They wrote Judea Capta, even when Mitzada was still, they were still around the Mitzada. Because that, so there was a fortress as in Jews living. They hated them, they're going to kill them anyway eventually. But once Jerusalem fell, Israel has fallen. And he came with a very heavy army. And he sent a general whose name was Rav Shika. And this Rav Shika sent a message. And he said, nobody can save you. None of the gods have saved the other peoples. Your God will not save you. It's futile. Surrender. And what happened? What happened is that Hashem did save Jerusalem. And that's a phenomenal and beautiful story where Yeshayahu Hanavi meets the king whose name is Chizkiyahu. And the Gemara says that Yeshayahu had a message for Chizkiyahu, but he thought Chizkiyahu should come to see him. He said the Melech, the king, should come to see the Navi. And the Navi didn't want to go. The Melech, on the other hand, said, I'm the Melech. The Navi should come see me. So they were standing on ceremony. What happened? Chizkiyahu fell ill, very ill, deathbed ill. And to his deathbed, so Yeshayahu and Navi came. Yeshayahu and Navi comes, and he's on his deathbed. And he came to pay him a visit. Bikr Cholim. So Yeshayahu and Avi says to him that you're going to die. He says, why am I going to die? He says, you know why? Because you're not listening to Hashem. He says, I, what, what did I do wrong? He says, we didn't get married. We didn't get married. You don't have children. You don't have a family. He says, but you know why. You know that I have this prophetic premonition that if I marry, my children will be wicked. Which actually happened. So Yeshayahu and Avi said... That's not your business. Your business is not to tell God what to do. Look into the crystal ball and see. Your business is to do what you're supposed to do. It's a mitzvah to get married and have children. That's what you're supposed to do. So Chizkiyo uh, says, okay, you know what? I know you have a daughter. I'll marry your daughter. And then the merit of you, of Yeshayo, and the merit of my ancestry, of David and that'll protect us. Yeshayo always said, ah, too little, too late. It's over. At this point, Chizkiyo, on his deathbed, drew himself together and he said... I may not be very, very healthy. I may be on my deathbed, I'm still the king. And I have a tradition from my grandfather, David and Malach, that even when a sharp sword rests upon your throat, you never give up hope. And he says, no such thing as too late. Until now, you told me prophecy, prophecy I accept. Your opinion, out! Out, he said, threw him out of the palace. And he says, Vayasev, Alakir, the Gemara Baruch says, Chizkiyot began to pray, and he prayed with fervor, and Hashem answered him. And that night, which is the night of Pesach, a great miracle happened. This is the first documented virtual reality. The armies of Rav Shika suddenly saw this virtual reality of, of thunderous hoofbeats, of massive armies, which were all in their minds. Or angels, however you, want to, however you want to term it. They were so frightened, they all abandoned the camp. Everybody abandoned the camp. And incredibly, it was a bunch of lepers that found this empty camp. Nobody believed it. It was quiet, it was quiet on the Western Front, and nobody knew. Nobody, knew, nobody believed it. But these lepers who are outside the city when they discovered it. A whole beautiful, incredible story in the Book of Kings. Bottom line, he never captured. Sancherv never captures Yishalayim. And afterwards, Sancherv goes crazy from what happens and his own sons assassinate him. So Sancherv ends up, he doesn't, he doesn't, he, ne he never really loses his kingdom, he just, he just gets killed. He lives as a king, a mighty king till the very end. But an epic emperor he wasn't because there was one city he didn't capture. And that city is Yerushalayim. Whereas when it comes to the time of Ahasuerus, Yerushalayim was under his dominion. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, tragically, does lay siege to Yerushalayim. And when he lays siege, he is successful. And he does destroy Yerushalayim and, of course, the base of Migdash. So Nebuchadnezzar was really an epic emperor. Whereas the incredible empire Sancherev built, which was the prototype of an empire, the greatest empire to date in that time, but nonetheless, he's still not included in those three epic emperors because not every city in the world was under his sway, control, or dominion. And uh, next week we'll continue by analyzing the last two. What about Darius? What about Daryavish? What about Korish? Seemingly, they would fit the bill. And we know that they did, it seems, dominate the holy city of Yerushalayim. So why were they not considered to be um, Malachim, who are Moshe Bekipa? These epic emperors, and, and the Gemara will answer, and then we will see 
the Gemara will begin to analyze afterwards some of the contradictions that seem to show up in the opening verses of the Megillah. To be continued. <laughs>